Matthew. Uh, Matthew 24. Um, Matt, I want Matthew 24, Matthew 10, and Matthew 16. Matthew 10, Matthew 16, and Matthew chapter 24. Well, while you're finding that, I just want to, I, I, I want to get right into things, but I want to say just a few things uh, beforehand. First of all, um, there's a conference. We're having a conference in Michigan in uh, October, October 20, 21, and 22. And the theme of our conference this year, the whole conference is going to be about the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. Uh, brother Dave Reed is coming, as well as uh, a brother out of Kentucky named Jeffrey Newnham. And we have flyers. They're this color, and they're on the table back there with the other conference notifications. Okay, Just a couple uh, words regarding what I'm going to do. Uh, Brother Fred uh, set a stage for you in the first hour regarding some things about the kingdom. And so I'm going to condense some areas of my sermon this morning so I can expand some others to try to uh, touch on some things that um, I think are important for us to talk about. So the title that I've been given to discuss is, Are the Preterists Right After All? The answer is no. (laughs) Have a nice lunch, okay? (laughs) Um, But uh, we're going to talk about that. A little bit this morning. I talked about this uh, about four or five years ago in 2013. I did a message at the conference regarding preterism. And so, um, you know, preterism hasn't changed much in five years. So some of the things that I'm going to say about it are going to be very similar to what I said before. But I have a few new wrinkles that I've put in, particularly regarding the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, because I just had to take the opportunity to do that. Matthew chapter 24 is where I want you to go first. Matthew chapter 24. As we think about preterism, uh, a lot of you probably don't even, have never even heard that word, don't even know what that is, and I will get to that in a moment, but I kind of want to set it up just a little bit first by looking at a few things here in Matthew 24. So if you look at Matthew chapter 24, the, the apostles come to Jesus, look at verse 1, and Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon the other that shall not be thrown down. Now look at verse 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Notice that they, they're asking him that. They want to know, uh, when are these things going to happen? What is going to be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world there? Now, Jesus starts to answer that here in Matthew 24. Look at verse 4. He says, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, uh, for these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes uh, in diverse places. And then notice what he says in verse 8. He says, all these things are the beginning of what? Now understand, what do they ask him in verse 3? They ask him, what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world, right? And starting in verse 4, Jesus starts to answer that. And he identifies famine and earthquake and war and pestilence and and, and all those things, right? And then in verse 8, he says, those are just the beginning of what? sorrows. Then if you drop down to verse 15, in verse 15, Christ goes on to say, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place. Well, we know from Daniel chapter 9, when does the abomination of desolation occur in the, in the, in the, in the 70th week, right? It happens in the midst of what? The week, according to Daniel chapter 9. So I want you to see that in verses 4 through 8, he's identifying the beginning of sorrows. Then in verse 15, he jumps and identifies something that's going to happen when? In the middle of the tribulation, in the middle of the 70th week. And then if you come out to verse um, 27, go over to verse 27, he says, For as lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even on the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, when does the Son of Man come? See, he, he, he gave you the beginning of sorrows, now he's given you the, he gave you the, the, what happened in the middle, the abomination of desolation. And now he's talking in verse 27, he's talking about the coming of who? The, the coming of the Son of Man. Look at verse 28. For wheresoever uh, the carcass is, there, the eagles, uh, there, there will the eagles be gathered together. Now look at verse 29. Immediately what? After 
the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heaven shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man when? In heaven. What I want you to see here to get started in Matthew 24 is the Lord Jesus Christ in answering the apostles' question about what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world, He talks to them about the beginning of sorrows He talks to them about what's going to happen in the midst of the week. And then he goes all the way out and talks to them about what's going to happen immediately after the tribulation of those days. And after that 70th week is over, who's going to return back to earth? The Lord Jesus Christ. And so what Matthew 24 is in a sense doing is is giving you just a, a summary sweep through some things that they're going to need to know to answer their question. Okay. Now, the main verse that we're after here is down in look at verse 32. So after all this, he says to them in verse 32, Now learn a parable of the fig tree, when his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. So he's telling them, look, when you guys see all these things that I've just said, you can know that the end is what? Near. Now, he's talking to them, obviously, according to prophecy. He's talking to them according to the prophetic time schedule. And then look what he says in verse 34. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass. What's the next word? Till all these things be what? All what things? All the stuff he just talked to him about, right? The beginning of sorrows, the middle of the week, the abomination of desolation, the end, the coming of the Son of Man, the signs, all those things, right? And then he says to him there in verse 34, he says, look, he says all, let me read it again, this generation shall not what? Pass till all these things be fulfilled. Okay? Now, I have a few questions for you. Number one, were all those things fulfilled? No, thank you. No. Okay. Did all of those events come to pass? No. Did the generation that Christ was addressing there die without Him coming to pass? You see the problem. Okay. So if I'm, if I'm disposed to be a critic of the Scripture, I come to this and I say, See, the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't know what He's what? talking about he just said this will happen this will happen this will happen and oh by the way this generation isn't going to die isn't going to pass until all this stuff that i just said to you what comes to pass okay so you you see there now i just ask it a different way was jesus lying was jesus telling the truth so then what is going on here how do we address this how do we understand and answer the what seems to be the potential problem that is created here, okay? So if the Lord's not lying, if He's telling the truth, but what He seems to be saying didn't happen the way that He said it would, then there has to be some reason or some explanation for why it didn't happen that way. Is everybody following that, okay? Now, one of the answers that has been offered to that in church history is to teach that everything that the Lord Jesus Christ is talking about in Matthew chapter 24 was already fulfilled in 70 A.D., when the Romans destroyed the temple at Jerusalem. Okay? There is an idea out there in theology. This is the idea of preterism, that that everything Christ said was already fulfilled in 70 A.D. Um, The implication also is, therefore, that we are now spiritual who? Israel, because everything that Christ said has already what? Been fulfilled, right? And why did it have to happen in 70 A.D.? Well, it had to happen within a time frame that the generation that he's addressing would have still been what? Alive. Otherwise, the thought is, well, that would make the Lord Jesus... Otherwise, it would make the Lord Jesus Christ out to be what? A liar, okay? So, in order to address the issue of preterism... See, I'm already behind. I should have had all that up already. But I want to go to this. I want to basically talk about four points with you this morning. The first one is, what is preterism? Okay? The second one is, when and why was preterism taught in church history? The third one is, what is a scriptural answer to preterism? And then I want to offer some concluding thoughts uh, in light of the Protestant uh, Reformation and the 500th anniversary and so forth, okay? 
So let's get let's get right into this. I forgot to hit the button, but I know what time I started. It was at quarter after, okay? So those of you that are keeping score, I know what time it is, all right? So the first one is what is preterism? That's my that's my first point. The title preterism is derived from the Latin word preterer, okay, which means past. So preterism claims that all biblical prophecy, including the events listed by the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 24 in the Olivet Discourse, as well as written by John in the book of Revelation, that all of these events have already been fulfilled, okay? So they've all come to pass. They've already been fulfilled according to the preterist position. Now, you need to be aware of the fact that there are two forms of preterism, okay? The first form of preterism is what some people will call or identify as moderate preterism. Moderate preterism holds that the resurrection and the second coming are future. Okay? So there, that, this position says the 70th week of Daniel, the tribulation, all that's already been fulfilled. The only two things that lie in the future to, that are, are yet to be fulfilled are um, the second coming and, excuse me, the, re, the, the, the resurrection and the second coming. So uh, all, all of those things, that would be the resurrection that's connected with the second coming and so forth. Okay? But all the other prophecies, the moderate position holds, that all the other prophecies in Matthew 24 20, and 25, as well as in Revelation 6 through 10, all of it has already been, been fulfilled in the first century before the destruction of Jerusalem, or destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Okay? So that's the moderate position. All right? The extreme position, or what might otherwise be known as full preterism, this says and maintains that all the New Testament predictions are past, including the resurrection and the second coming, and all of it has already been fulfilled uh, as of the first century. Okay, So, from a theological standpoint, the preter preterism stands in direct contrast with what is called in theological terms futurism. Okay, You and I today, whether you know it or not, we are out there in the marketplace of ideas from a theological standpoint, we are futurists, okay? We believe that the book of Revelation has not yet what? Been fulfilled, right? So in other words, it, it awaits a future what? Fulfillment, right? So in theological debates, the preterists who believe everything has already happened and been fulfilled by 70 AD stand in opposition to the futurists, those who believe that the 70th week of Daniel, the tribulation, the second coming, all that, the, the establishment of the kingdom and all that awaits a future fulfillment. They are in direct opposition to what the preterists have to say. So that means then, just in simple terms, a mid acts Pauline, rightly dividing dispensationalist stands obviously in direct contrast with a preterist. Okay? Just, just by the way the theological positions and so forth have been um, understood. Okay? Now, preterists and preterism have gained traction as a result of dumb behavior on the part of futurists. Let me explain. Anytime some knucklehead says the rapture is going to happen in 1988, and here's 88 reasons why, and then it doesn't happen, right? Then everyone's like, see, these futurists, these people that believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, they don't know what they're talking about. And all of the date setting and all of the predictions a few years ago, it was that Van Campen guy, I believe his name was, where he made that prediction and bought billboards all, all across America about what the day of the rapture was going to be. So when, when, Bible believe, when, when people who are disposed to believe the Bible or study the Bible see that kind of date setting, see that future forecasting and then it not happening, one of the results of that is they turn away from the dispensational future understanding of the book of Revelation towards the preterist position that says everything is already past. Okay? Now, there are three major proof texts. There are three major proof texts that are used by preterists. So come with me. Get, uh, I told you to get three passages. Let's look at Matthew 10 first. Matthew 10. Now... Uh, Brother Fred mentioned this and read it from this passage quite extensively in the first hour this morning. So I'm just going to go to the verse that I need. Verse 23. 
Jesus is talking to those apostles that he's just commissioned and given power to and told them not to go uh, to the Gentiles and so forth. Look at verse 23. But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another one. For verily I say unto, unto you, here it is, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man what? Okay? You see, you see that verse? The Son of Man's not going to come until when? Till they go over all the cities of what? Israel. Come to Matthew 16. Now, I'll explain why the preterists will use these verses here in a moment. But I want you to see them first. Matthew, uh, Matthew 16. <coughs> Matthew 16. Verse um, 27. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of His Father with His angels... And then he shall reward every man according to his works. Verily I say unto you, there, uh, there be some standing here, okay, which shall not taste of death, what's the next word? Till they see the Son of Man coming in his what? Folks, is the Lord Jesus Christ telling these guys that some of the people standing there listening to him aren't going to die until they see the fulfillment of the prophetic program? Okay? But... You've already answered my questions and identified that that stuff didn't what? That stuff didn't happen yet, okay? So the preterist position, and I'm going to throw them a bone here for a little bit for a second. The preterist position is born out of trying to reconcile what they think is a theological problem. The problem is they're giving you the wrong answer. The wrong answer to the issue of pre the the, the, the the right answer, I should say to this, is to understand that Israel rejects her king, rejects her kingdom, and God subsequently does what? Sets that nation aside, right? That's the, that's the correct, rightly divided dispensational answer to, to, to what the, the preterists here are, are observing, okay? So I have a long thing here uh, from the International Preterist Association. Preterist.org. I'm not going to. I was originally going to read all of it, but I don't think I need to. I think you get the point. But a few things. These verses. So I'm quoting from their website now. These verses, and they're referring to Matthew 10, Matthew 16, and the verse we read in Matthew 24 to start with. These verses have always troubled Bible students and have been used by liberal theologians to attack the inspiration of Scripture. Now you understand why, right? Because it seems like. Jesus is saying something that never what? That never happens the way that he says it, right? So the preterism says, oh, well, we've got an answer for that. Everything has already been what? Fulfilled, and we're spiritual Israel and all that. That's the answer of preterism. And then they say, the reason that these passages were not fulfilled when they were supposed to be the first century generation, uh, so G let me start that over. They reason, excuse me, that's a big mistake. They reason that on these that these passages were not fulfilled when they were supposed to be by uh, to, uh, in the first century generation. So Jesus and the New Testament writers failed in their predictions and they were therefore not inspired. So liberal theologians say, "Well, Jesus didn't know what he's talking about. He said it would happen, and it what, and it didn't. Therefore, he's not inspired. There's a problem with the Word of God, and you can uh, let your mind run on where that leads." Okay. Then they go on to say, "But these verses point to Christ's coming." in some sense, in connection with the fall of Jerusalem at 70 A.D. And then they say, so Jesus' predictions were fulfilled. He did not fail, nor do we need to engage in theological gymnastics. You're all theological gymnasts, in case you didn't know. In theological gymnastics, to try to explain away the seeming delay or postponement of His return it happened right on schedule. So they are saying, and the preterist position is, okay, that everything has already been what? Fulfilled. The Bible's integrity is maintained because everything that Christ said would happen was fulfilled by 70 A.D. We don't really have a problem here. And the real problem is with these futurists, these dispensationalists that are engaging in, quote, theological gymnastics, to try to explain why it was postponed, okay? Now, I'm assuming most of you believe that it was postponed, right? 
Now, I want to move on into my second point, which was when and why preterism was taught. So there's your, there's your friend right there, okay. Um, in the 16th century, the Protestant reformers viewed the Pope or the papacy as the Antichrist. Okay, If you read Luther, if you read Calvin, if you read all of these guys that were writing during the age of the Reformation, it is almost universally understood by the Protestant reformers that the papacy of the Pope were the Antichrist. Okay, And so the Catholics have to sort of, do they like this idea? Do they like this, this rampant Protestant teaching that the Pope is the Antichrist? So they have to try to come up with a way to combat this, right? So people will talk about in theology that one way that was developed was that an Alcazar, who was a Jesuit monk, invented the preterist position that everything was fulfilled in 70 A.D. to escape the Protestant teaching that the Pope is the Antichrist. So in other words, one way of getting around what the Reformers are saying is to say, well, they're wrong because everything was already what? Everything was already fulfilled. There's nothing, there's nothing left in the future that is unfulfilled. Okay? I will t- come back to this at the end. There is also a, an attack on futurism or dispensationalism that says two Jesuit monks invented the futurist position to escape the Protestant teaching that the Pope is the Antichrist. And this argument is also used as a means of discrediting dispensationalism and John Nelson Darby. And so there's, there's all these things that are said out there if you think about theological uh, debates and so forth, all right? So I'm going to leave that up there while I just say a few other things and we get into the next point, all right? Preterists will attempt to cry foul, and they will try to say and cite fragmentary evidence from the church father's origin and Eusebius to say that Alcazar really, the Jesuit monk Alcazar did not really invent preterism, okay? The problem with that is when you study what the preterists teach, it is very clear that preterism in its modern form does have an origin here with the Jesuit monk Alcazar, and he is seeking, it seems to me, to escape the idea that the Pope is the Antichrist that was prevalently, prevalently taught by the Protestant reformers, Okay. So they will cite 6th century commentaries on Revelation and other things to try to get around this, but it's pretty clear to me that that, that those are just sort of futile attempts. But I want to caution you, okay? What are, are we accused, are dispensationalists accused of believing often a new doctrine? Yes. That the doctrine of the pre-tribulation rapture, that dispensational theology in general, is a new invention of John Nelson Darby in the 1800s, Okay. So we cannot hang our hat, we cannot hang our case against preterism simply by saying, well, a Jesuit monk came up with it, therefore it's what? Wrong. We're going to have to build a biblical case for why preterism is what? Is wrong. Okay? So, Brother Fred was talking to you. We went to Matthew chapter 3 and we read about John the Baptist. So here's where I'm not going to have you turn here to save some time. Okay? Okay? In Matthew chapter 3, John the Baptist was calling the nation of Israel to what? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is what? At hand. Okay? In Matthew chapter 4, the Lord Jesus Christ says the same thing John the Baptist said. He says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is what? At hand, right? So are John the Baptist and Jesus Christ teaching the same thing? Come over to Mark chapter 1. I don't believe we went to this one, so we'll go to this one. Go to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, verse 14. Mark chapter 1, verse 14. Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is what? Fulfilled. And the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and what? You notice that John says the time is what? The time is, first he says the time is what? Fulfilled. Then he says the kingdom of God is what? Well, why is it at hand? It's at hand because the first statement says the time is what? If the time's fulfilled, then that means the time is right. And if the time is right, that means the kingdom's at what? At hand, right? And all of that, and I think we know this, all of that is being governed by Daniel's prophecy in Daniel chapter 9 of the 70th week, of the 70 weeks, right? That literally, 
uh, you, you think about the wise men in Matthew chapter 2, right? They come to Jerusalem seeking Him that is born King of the Jews. How do those guys know that the time was right, that the King of the Jews should be born, other than they were reading Daniel, they had the Old Testament, and they were able to figure out to some degree that the approximate time was correct, and when they see the star in the east, they know it means something, and it causes them to journey to Jerusalem seeking who? The King of the Jews. So my point is, trying to build off the other messages for the sake of time, that when you get into this time period here, starting with John the Baptist and during the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, you read these statements about the time being fulfilled and the kingdom at hand, and you read the reason you're reading those statements is because it was fulfilled. And it was what? It was at hand. It was near. Okay? Go to Luke 19. You read about the... <coughs> triumphal entry of the Lord Jesus Christ into Jerusalem. And we know that that happened at exactly the precise day and time that prophecy said that it should happen. You know, one of the things that's always puzzled me is the Lord Jesus Christ says, and and, and Fred mentioned this, He says that man cannot know the day and the what? The hour. Brother Reed talked about Bible math yesterday. If you're doing some Bible math, yes, you cannot know the day and the hour, but should you have some understanding in a general sense that things are getting ready to what? Happen here, right? You you can have a general understanding that things are getting to a culminating point, and if you missed it, are these two guys telling you that? Okay? So, Luke 19, verse uh, 41. This is after he's... He, he's, he's coming into the city and so forth. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. That's Jerusalem. Saying, if thou hadst, if thou hadst known, even at, even at, excuse me, even thou, at least in this thy, what? Day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee that thy enemies shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee round and keep thee uh, and keep thee in on every side and shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another because thou knewest not what should they have known could they have known in should have and could have was it fulfilled and at hand that it should happen. But it didn't, right? It didn't happen. So what is going on? You know, one other thing I just want to mention quick is if this is at hand, the kingdom, what else is at hand? That. Because prophetically, does that have to happen before that? Okay? So literally, if you think about this, okay, Jesus Christ comes on the scene and has roughly a three-year what? Earthly ministry, right? He is, he is cut off. When He's cut off, that's the end of the 69th week according to Daniel's prophecy, right? We understand that an extra year is inserted in here uh, after, for various dispensational reasons that take too long for me to explain at the moment, right? But we also know how long is this going to be? Seven years. So if you count the three-year earthly ministry of Christ and add the seven years of the tribulation, literally, are they within a ten-year time frame of the stuff being fulfilled according to the prophetic time schedule? So when he says to them, hey, look, guys, some of you aren't going to taste death until these things come to pass, does he foresee a two... Is he, when he says that, is he saying that with a 2,000-year interruption in mind of the prophetic program? No, he's telling them exactly what is the case for them at the time period in which they are living. Is everybody with that? Amen. Go with me back to Matthew 24. So, every language, Greek, English, that does it Spanish, every language has grammar, okay? And there are rules in language and there are rules in grammar that, that help explain certain things. I went in and talked to the, my Span, a Spanish teacher in my high school for over an hour and a half about moods and so forth, uh, verb moods in Spanish. She thought I was nuts, I think. 
but I wanted to know how it worked, okay? Matthew 24, and I'm going to just say something here about this, okay? Matthew 24, look at verse 34. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not, what? Pass. What's the next word? Till all these things be fulfilled. Now, that statement shall not pass. That verb that is translated there, shall not pass, that is in the subjunctive mood. Okay? And what that means in in just very simplistic terms is that means that the fulfillment of what the Lord is saying is going to be dependent or contingent on a certain set of what? Circumstances. If the circumstances are met, if the contingencies are met, then will it happen the way He says? If they're not met, will it not happen the way He says? Okay, so let me just read this to you. The subjunctive mood expresses doubt or something contrary to fact, okay? The idea here is that it is the mood of probability or desirability, but the action described may or may not occur depending on the circumstances, okay? Now, let me show you how this works out. Come over to Acts 3. Come over to Acts 3. And Fred talked about this already, but I'm going to sort of do it a little bit from a different angle here. Go over to Acts 3. Okay. What am I doing on time? It's running short, but we're okay. Acts 3. Look with me. I'm just going to go straight to verse... Well, no, verse 12. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we have made this man to walk? The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, have glorified His Son, whom ye delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate um, when he was determined to let him go. Was Pilate going to let him go? Who wanted him crucified? The Jews, the leadership of the nation, right? Verse 14, But ye denied the Holy One and just, and desired a murderer be granted unto you. Barabbas, right? And killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And His name through, and his name through faith is the name hath made, uh, made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by Him hath given Him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I wot that through ignorance ye did it, as did also your what? What was the attitude of the nation of Israel during the earthly ministry toward the Lord Jesus Christ? Right? Now, here's Peter in Acts 3, after the day of Pentecost there in Acts 2. And notice what he says in verse verse 18. But those things which God hath, which God before hath showed by the mouth of His prophets that Christ should suffer, He hath what? The suffering of Christ, had that been fulfilled? What was, what was left? The glory that should what? The glory that should follow, right? Now look at verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from who? The presence of the Lord. So what must Israel do? Repent. If they repent, will the times of refreshing come from the presence of the Lord? If they don't repent, will the times of refreshing come from the presence of the Lord? No. So it is completely and wholly contingent on whether or not the nation what? Repents. If they repent, the times of refreshing will come, and the prophetic program will go on as scheduled, and it will end, and it will be all wrapped up in a nice, neat little package, and that will be what? That will be it. Okay? What if they don't repent? It's not going to happen. Okay? Okay? The Greek verb there that is translated in your English King James Bible there where it says, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your uh, your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. You see in that verse where it says shall come? Guess what mood that's in? It's subjunctive again. Why is it subjunctive? Because the times of refreshing coming or not coming is contingent upon whether they do what the first part of that verse says and whether or not they what? Repent. Go to verse 20. No, verse, yeah, verse 20. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. You see the verb in there, shall send? Well, he's only going to send them if they what? If they repent. 
Okay? So how is the integrity of the Scripture maintained when you get to verses like Matthew... Matthew um, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Look at verse. Look at the next verse, verse 21. Whom the heaven what? Do you understand that he had to die, he had to be buried, he had to rise again, and he had to ascend up on high. According to, uh, I'm not going to have you turn there, but according to Luke 19, and receive what? The kingdom. And then once he had ascended on high to receive the kingdom, now he's waiting to what? Come back. What is he waiting on? He is waiting on whether or not that nation is going to do what? Repent. Repent. Okay? So the return of Christ to execute the rest of the prophetic program was contingent upon the heart attitude of the nation of Israel towards her king. If if Israel would repent, Christ would return and establish the kingdom. If, If... Uh, If Christ did not return with the kingdom, the generation Christ was addressing in Matthew 24, 34 would what? Well, so if they, if they don't repent, they're all going to what? That generation is going to what? It's going to die and they're going to die not having seen the what? The fulfillment. The answer, folks, to preterism is in rightly dividing the word of truth. The answer to preterism is understanding that, go to Ephesians 3, go to Ephesians 3. It's fascinating when you think about the fact that Ephesians chapter, it's better to read the verse first, Ephesians chapter 3 verse 9. To make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid where? Where was the mystery hid? Was the mystery hid in the Old Testament? No. Was the mystery hid in the Gospels? No. The mystery was hid in who? In God, right? So that means that John the Baptist, Jesus, and Peter and the Twelve... What, while they're operating down here, they are functioning. There's a, I know there's controversy about Jesus, okay? I'm not going to get into that. But they are functioning in such a way that is completely consistent with what program? The kingdom program, right? Because the mystery is hidden in who? It's hidden in God until God reveals it to and through who? The Apostle Paul. So you need to understand something here, right? People that play cards, they'll talk about people having a tell. Or they're talking about pitchers in baseball tipping their pitches, right? The Godhead never tips their pitch. They never do anything to signify to Israel in any way, shape, manner, or form that they've got that they've got another what? That they've got another plan that they've kept secret and hidden God that they planned before the world what? Began, right? And so it is only once Israel has had every chance available and has demonstrated they are not going to repent that God judicially sets that nation aside, saves Saul of Tarsus, and begins a process of committing unto him the revelation of what? The mystery. Okay? But when the Lord Jesus Christ is talking to those guys in Matthew 12, Matthew 16, Matthew 10, He says nothing to give away the fact that this is in the mind of God to do. Okay? So, in time past, the mystery was hid in God. During His earthly ministry, the Lord Jesus Christ did nothing to tip the Godhead's hand with respect to the revelation of the mystery. God, now this is important, God dealt with Israel fairly, according to the terms of His program with Israel. Now, does God in His foreknowledge know that they're going to stone Stephen and they're not going to repent? Yeah, because He's already already determined before the world began that He's going to do what? This, but He doesn't deal with man in any way in this time period here to tip His hand that He's going to eventually do what? He's eventually going to do that. So He deals with Israel... Now think about this. If Israel has an ink, if Israel ever had an inkling that God was going to do this, you could see where they might have been disposed to just say, "Eh, we'll just wait." 
right? It doesn't matter. God's going to set us aside anyway, so why should we bother what? Repenting. So, let me just read this again. God dealt with Israel fairly according to the terms of Israel's program. The integrity of God's word is retained, not by embracing preterism, with its position that everything was fulfilled by 70 A.D., but the integrity of God's word is retained by rightly dividing the word of truth as set forth by the Apostle Paul. The answer to preterism is to rightly divide the word of truth. Now, in conclusion, so how much time do I have? Another hour, good, okay. John Nelson Darby. So what I want to do, let me just go back to, what I want to do is just end by saying a few things about this. Okay. John Nelson Darby did not invent dispensationalism in the 1800s. I've got a, you're in Ephesians 3, I've got a verse right here that says, if, you're, if you've heard the dispensation of the grace of God. Dispensationalism has been in the Bible since God inspired the Scripture. Okay. Now men, to varying degrees, in various times and places, have acknowledged this, what the dispensational approach that God had already put where? Into his word, right? So Darby is not inventing anything new. Darby is just acknowledging and recognizing some things that he observes where? In the word of God, right? I told you, I've, I've said in the past, the idea of truth, people like to talk about truth being lost and recovered. And I understand why they like to talk about it that way. But for me, that's not quite the way it is. I view it as having been willfully abandoned and then having experienced a systematic resurgence. Okay? The truth was not lost like you forget your key, where you put your keys. Okay? The truth was there and available throughout the entire history of the dispensation of grace for anybody who cared to pay attention. Right? What happened in the 1800s is some, some, somebody and some buddies, they got into the Scripture and they started to realize that some of their Protestant thinking wasn't what? Wasn't right, wasn't, wasn't adequate, wasn't correct. And so that leads to Reformation 2.0. Okay? Reformation 2.0 is the resurgence of Pauline truth that happened during the 1800s. So, okay, I covered that, blah, blah. Darby is going to spearhead a resurgence in the truth that, that, that basically surged through the English-speaking world during the uh, middle part of the 19th century. Now, this resurgence, okay, this resurgence came about because of the realization of some very particular things, okay? And what was spearheading the resurgence in Pauline truth was the realization that there is a difference between Israel and the body of Christ, okay? And that Israel's hope is earthly, and that the church's hope is he heavenly, okay? Once that hit the stage, once they got that in their thinking, that really got the resurgent juices flowing, if you will, and it started a movement, particularly in England, that spread around the world for a resurgence in dispensational truth. Okay, John Nelson Darby did not invent the word rapture. John Nelson Darby was not the first person to talk about the rapture. He was not the first person to use the word rapture. Okay? How much time do I got? Okay, good. One, let me back. Once the distinction between Israel and an earthly hope and the body of Christ and a heavenly hope was understood, then things started to what? Fall into place. Okay? So, I have here... Where'd it go? Here it is. This is uh, the cover page from the works of Joseph Mead. Joseph Mead lived in the, in the 1600s. He was a British theologian. This is, the, this is the works of Joseph Mead. This was published in 1665. Now you tell me if Darby invented the word rapture. Okay. Quoting from page 776. I will add this more namely that many... Excuse me, I'll start over. I, will, I add this more namely what may be convinced what may be conceived, excuse me, to be the cause of this rapture of the saints on high to meet the Lord in the clouds. What's he talking about? 
He's talking about saints being caught up to meet the Lord in the clouds. And what word is he using to describe it? What year did he write this? 1665, almost 200 years before Darby. Don't buy the lies that are out there to attack dispensationalism. Okay, don't buy them. And then he goes on to say, to meet the Lord in the crowds, rather than to wait his coming to earth. Does this guy understand that there's a difference between the catching away of saints to meet the Lord in the clouds and the Lord's return what? Now, I don't want to mislead you. He didn't put it in the right spot. Okay? He didn't put it in the right spot. Here's his view. He teaches a pre-stage coming. Okay? So he says that the saints are on earth and they are persecuted by the Antichrist during the tribulation. At the end of the tribulation, there's the rapture of the saints. This is the quote that I just read to you. To meet the Lord in the clouds. The earth is destroyed by fire, according to 2 Peter 3.10. And then the saints come back with the Lord to a new earth. And that's the second stage when he returns with the saints to a new earth to set up his kingdom. Okay? Now, is that a two-stage coming? Do you know, do you know anybody else that believes in a two-stage coming? Does he have it in the right spot? No. But 1665, Joseph Mead, Increase Mather, 1709, Cotton Mather, 1729, they all taught that view. Okay? Now look at this. Now we have Morgan Edwards in 1788. He's teaching that the saints are taken to heaven at the 1260 days in the middle of what? And then they return back with the Lord here. You need to understand something here. In the sequence and the resurgence of the truth, when they first started to understand that there is a difference between 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and Revelation chapter 19, the first position put it here. The next historical position put it here. Okay? Yeah, getting closer. Then the, the Jesuit monks, they, they go the other way for a while. This is, this is 1790 now. He puts it back over here that they're caught up. There's a 45-day period in which the earth is destroyed by fire, and then they return back with, uh, with the second coming. But you understand, who put it in the right spot? When Darby understood that Israel's hope was a kingdom on earth, and that the church's hope was a heavenly destiny in the heavenly places, the timing of the rapture did what? Fell right in the spot. Okay? And once this is known, this is going to be the driving force of a resurgence in Pauline truth. Now, I'm almost done. But I heard Dave say yesterday that doesn't mean he's getting ready to finish right now. So once Darby... Once Darby understood the difference between Israel and the body of Christ and the church's unity with its, heart and he with its head in heaven, excuse me, the correct placement of 1 Thessalonians 4 before the 70th week of Daniel fell into its natural and easy place. Darby did not invent this teaching. It was contained within the pages of Scripture for 2,000 years, and it had already been experiencing a systematic refinement in the thinking of the Reformers. And it's when Darby gets the dispensational light and understanding about that distinction that it falls into place. Now, I want to say this, two things in conclusion. When viewed in this fashion, the pre-tribulational understanding of the rapture is the result of nearly a 200-plus year process of doctrinal refinement. Now, there's this also idea out there that Darby got this from listening to some tongue-speaking occult girl in Glasgow, Scotland. Okay? If you've read Dave McPherson, you're aware of this. Within the Plymouth Brother movement that Darby was the leader of, there had been a split, okay, between the open brother and the closed brother. And one of Darby's former associates was a guy named B.W. Newton. B.W. Newton ends up not liking Darby so much. But this is what he said about Darby, when he heard about what was going on in Port Glasgow, Scotland, with this, this tongue-speaking woman, he went there and listened. And this is what his later enemy said about it. He said, quote, But what decided him, that's Darby, when on the spot was when those who were inspirited, that's speaking in tongues and carrying on like you see on TV, 
But, when, but what decided him when on the spot was when those who were inspirited were expounding prophetic scriptures, such as Isaiah, respecting Israel and Jerusalem, they explained them as being prophetic of Christian churches of this dispensation. Do you understand what Darby just said? He just said the way he knew that that charismatic Pentecostal mumbo-jumbo that was going on there wasn't legitimate, wasn't real, is because in their tongues meeting, they were taking Isaiah and applying it to the church. You know anybody else that would have a similar idea? Okay. So, when viewed in this fashion, the pre-tribulational understanding of the rapture is a result of nearly 200 plus years of doctrinal refinement to reconcile 1 Thessalonians 4 and Revelation 19. The resurgence of dispensational truth was the driving force of the Reformation 2.0. Now listen, any attempt to countermand the pre-tribulational rapture, whether it is via preterism or mid or post-tribulational position on the rapture, represents a regression in truth. It is a regression. It is not to your benefit to go to any one of those three positions. And last, the thing that stopped, I, I believe this is my personal, private, subjective opinion, the thing that stopped the resurgence in Pauline truth that was happening in Great Britain was to fundamentally redefine and change what the Bible was. That happened between 1870 and 1880, right in the middle of the greatest period of Pauline resurgence since Luther. It's my personal, private, subjective opinion, you don't have to agree with me if you don't want to, that the adversary's response to the resurgence in Pauline truth that was going on was to fundamentally call into question what the Bible was. Okay? If all these new versions are supposed to make the Bible easier to understand, isn't that what they say? Then why don't we see more people coming to Pauline dispensationalism? It should be easier to understand, not what? And all of that is just lies to mask what has is, what is really happened. And that's a commercial to come back at 4 o'clock. So let's, let's pray. Lord, thanks for this day and for this time and for your word. We're grateful that we have it, that we can trust it, that we can rely upon it. We ask, we're grateful for this conference, for the time and attention that has gone into these messages that have been prepared by the brethren, and we just pray there will be continued edification throughout the rest of the week. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.